state now. The Radio Whammo Breakfast. Talking politics with Russell Norman. co of the Green Party. He's um, currently hanging out on the, near the cable car in Wellington City. G'day there. Hey, Whammo. How's it going? Very good, very good. Hey, it's budget week um, this week. All kinds of exciting um, budgetary stuff. Um, and uh, it means that the party, the other, the other parties, have to come up with their own ideas for what um, the government should be doing. In the Green Party, you guys have already come out with an alternative budget. I don't know where Labor's is, but you guys have released yours. What, what's the crux of it? Uh, well, the crux of it is that uh, that we need to look at some revenue options that help transform the economy. Uh, so by that, I mean that if you look at National, what they're proposing are spending cuts and big increases in debt. Uh, Labor's plan by default is big increases in debt. And so what we're saying is, look, you've also got to look at the revenue side. There's a number of revenue measures you can introduce uh, which can broaden the tax base move our economy in a sustainable direction and raise some money so that we don't have the spending cuts and we don't have the big increase in debt. So we think that's a, a, the third position in this debate. OK. Um, and what about um, the, you know, the alternatives to dairy? I mean, because people say if, if you're, we're not going to have a massive, intensive dairy farming, then, heck, we don't have much of an economy. What is the alternative to that? Uh, I think the dairy sector is going to remain as an important part of our economy, um, but it's going to have to be tamed a little bit um, so that it stops polluting our rivers. So what takes up the um, slack? Uh, I, I mean, I think that in, there's, there's a number of options. So we've promoted a kind of clean, green technology. Um, when you look internationally, the fastest, one of the fastest growing sectors of international trade is actually the clean technology sector, uh, which is things like renewable energy, which we happen to have quite a lot of expertise in. Right. Uh, so, so we'd like to see, for example, the use of the... We've got these big state-owned enterprises at the moment, um, and they could be a platform for the development of a clean technology sector in New Zealand. And the great thing about them is because they're state-owned, they're not going to go overseas. Um, and so we can actually develop a set of clean technology industries using those big state-owned enterprises with all their expertise and capital to do that. So what are we, are we talking about? Um, you know, training people to um, in, in this sector to what come up with I- new ideas for um, transport or um, power generation? What about and also the manufacturing side as well? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of those things. I mean, we're already exporting um, some of the geothermal technology. We're building geothermal plants um, in the states, actually, huh. um, the state-owned enterprises, and we're doing some wind, uh, some wind building across the Pacific, uh, wind power. So we we do have some good expertise there. Is that going to uh, so is, is that stuff going to employ enough people? Uh, it will employ a lot of people. Look, it's, uh, I think the green transition which we've got to go through uh, is going to be challenging. I'm not going to underplay that. Um, but, I mean, this is where there's a massive job growth um, overseas. I mean, if you look at the Danes, I mean, they now have a massive wind turbine industry uh, because they went down that path 20 years ago. Um, so, you, you know, there is a there is a huge industry internationally in, in energy. Yeah. And when you think about the transition, you know, we've got to move away from coal. My God, the amount of investment that's going to go into clean energy generation um, has to be astronomical if yeah. we're going to avoid yeah. out of control climate change. Yeah, and it's and when, when you're talking about um, you know clean um, clean energy and also um, clean technology, this is the premium stuff, isn't it? It's like it's like it's like people are being upsold. The rest of the world would be upsold on our stuff. <clears throat> yeah, I mean it. Rather than trying to kind of build something at the bottom of a commodity um, kind of pyramid, we're trying to actually build intellectual property and use the things that we're good at. Mm. Um, so New Zealand does have, you know, good education systems. We do have a lot of intellectual capacity um, in education. Um, and we have a background in renewable energy generation. I mean, it's not the only thing. There's, you know, that we also need to build, obviously, on our clean, green primary production sector. You yeah. know, we, we, get a good brand, we get a good premium out of that. Um, and we've got to protect that, um, and that's you know a, a key part of the economy. I'm not downplaying that. Okay, but what if um, you know what, what what if we do move away from this in, intensifying dairy? You know, there's an, an, you know, intensive dairy farming. If we move away from that, what happens to that land? You know, what else do we do with the land? You know, that these farmers have. Well, there, there's actually been quite a bit of work done. Some of it actually um, has been paid for by Dairy NZ, um, which looks at. Uh, dairy NZ is like the, the group organisation for all the dairy companies in New Zealand. And that looks at what a less intensive model looks like. And what they found was that you still use the land for dairy, but you have much lower stocking rates, um, but you make the same amount of money, uh, which kind of sounds odd. But the reason, the reason for that is that you have much lower input costs. Like we spend a fortune on urea, 
um, which is, you know, this industrial um, nitrogen fertiliser. Mm. And farmers spend a fortune on vet bills uh, because the cows get sick all the time um, because of what they're fed and because of the, 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 the numbers per hectare. Um, so when you look at the, the modelling that's been done around this, and there are lots of examples as well, um, actually there's people making good money with much lower intensity dairying. And I think that that is the kind of direction we need to go. And I, I mean, I was talking to a farmer in the Wairapa who's you know, gone organic. Um, he's making lots more money, yeah. uh, much lower stocking rates, uh, because he's just not spending as much on, on all the inputs and he gets more for his milk. But what do we do with the land that's been converted to dairying, say, in, in the... In the um in the Canterbury region, uh, you know, marginal dairy farm land. What, what do we do with that? Well, it, prob- it depends a bit on what it is, but some of it could still be used for dairying, but just at a much lower intensity. I mean, you know, you know we can have farming. It's just that <laughs> it's just, there's limits to how, how intense you can go. Um, uh, in terms of other land use, I mean, you know, who knows? We've had lots of land use revolutions in New Zealand over the last 100 years. No doubt we'll have others. Um, we'll see. We'll see, but... I mean, I think you can still use it for daring. It just needs to, mm. the, the intensity needs to be pulled back. Mm. Um, interesting tweet from you this morning. You said that the, um, this is reported in the Don Post, that the average dairy farmer pays only $1,500 tax on $500,000 income is due to expense write-offs. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting story it, it, on the front page of the Dom. It, it kind of looks at how much tax your average dairy farmer pays versus how much your average worker pays. Um, and so, you know, your average worker pays maybe $8,000 tax on $50,000 income, whereas your average dairy farmer is paying, I think it was 1500 on um, 500000 income. Now, it's a bit more complicated than that because what's happening is that the, the dairy farm, that income has to be offset against all their expenses um, for running the business. Um, and, but particularly it's offset against the cost of interest on the loan um, to buy the land and the equipment. And so um, it's understandable that they end up paying a slow rate of tax, but where they make the money is on the capital gains. Right. Um, so we've seen a huge increase in the value of rural land. It's been like housing. We've had a speculative housing bubble, but we've also had a speculative rural land bubble. And so people have made a fortune selling the land when it becomes more valuable. Yeah. And that's where there's this giant hole in our tax system. If you get income from capital gains, it's tax-free. But if you get income from wages and salaries, you get taxed on it. And that's why we've been promoting a, a capital gains tax excluding the family home, to actually make the tax system much fairer. Now, d- didn't you um, quiz John Key about capital gains taxes yesterday in Parliament and then he decided to make a joke about the um, IMF sex scandal? <laughs> yeah, twice. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that the, all the institutions, the International Monetary Fund, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the government's own savings working group have all come out in favour of a capital gains tax. And the reason is, is that they want to move capital away from housing speculation and rural land speculation into more productive uses. Um, and a capital gains tax helps achieve that. Um, key, of course, they, they don't want to go there because they don't want to upset the apple cart and it's a bit controversial. Mm. Um, but, yeah, he was making jokes about the IMF, um, which... Uh, Oh, pretty strange, to be honest. Yeah, and uh, no surprises this week that some um, white-haired old fossil wants to go uh, fossil fuel hunting in the Golden Bay region. Uh, it looks like it's going to be the next flashpoint for um, for environmentalists to uh, start protesting. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's a particularly sensitive area. I mean, the, the Abel Tasman National Park is really one of our iconic um, national parks um, and, is, and is in a lot of our international literature when we um, promote New Zealand to the international tourist market and let's remember tourism is one of our biggest export industries um, just behind dairy. Uh, so yeah it's a, it seems a, a puzzling place where you just um, have, a, have a bit of an oil free-for-all. Yeah I mean it's, it's I would say more sensitive than, um, than Great Barrier Island. Uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, they're both pretty sensitive, but yeah, I mean, uh, it is particularly sensitive because if you get oil coming out of a out of a well and coming onto the the white sands around Abel Tasman National Park, it's um. Can you imagine it? Damaging. Can you imagine it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Just crazy. All right, hey, thanks, um, thanks, Russell. Enjoy the rest of the um, the cable car journey there. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, there, mate. See ya. See ya. Russell uh, Norman, co-leader of the.